about is called factorials, permutations, and combinations. In this video, we'll cover factorials and permutations. And in the last video uh, that we have for this unit, you will look at combinations. Um, so first I wanna focus on just the difference between combinations and permutations. Over the next few days, you're gonna get uh, different types of questions that read very similarly, but the slight difference in them is the difference between combination and permutations, okay? Um, and the only difference between these two methods is the order mattering or the order mat not mattering. So if the order does not matter, we are going to use the method called a combination. Okay. And as we go through examples, we'll kind of explain what it means for the order to matter and what it means for the order to not matter. But for right now, all you need to make a note of is, is if that the order does not matter, we're going to use a combination. That's something that you can add to that a sheet you either printed with the table on it or maybe you opened up a Google Doc and did it that way. But for combination, order doesn't matter. And so for permutations, order does matter. Okay, just two key ideas to keep in mind as you watch this video and the next video. Now, before we get into permutations and combinations, they both use an idea called factorial. Factorial in, in math is, laid, is symbolized by a exclamation point. And what factorial symbol represents is a multiplication of a series of descending natural numbers, which sounds wordy and confusing. As you look at the examples, I think it's pretty straightforward. Four factorial is simply four times three times two times one. Seven factorial is seven times six times five times four times three times two times one, and so on. Okay. Now, you are going to need a calculator here, and um, I would recommend one of two options. If you have a graphing calculator, uh, then you can use your graphing calculator. If you do not have a graphing calculator, go to our class site, go to unit resources, and right at the top you see a link to Desmos calculator. I will keep that link up there always, and for every test I will have a Desmos calculator available to you. And so if you click that link, it brings you to the Desmos calculator. Now you see it as kind of a graphing type of calculator, which is one thing that it does, but it also has different functions that we're going to use as well, okay? Uh, and I would keep that, keep this tab open while we're going through these notes because we're gonna be kind of uh, going back and forth quite a bit. Um, and you're gonna wanna know, if, know how to use this. And again, if you have a graphing calculator, then just have that out by your side, okay? So, Find the following values. And again, I'm not going to have you do any, any mental math here. You can definitely use a calculator for this. So two factorial. Okay? And I'm going to go over both the graphing calculator and on decimals how to do this. Now on decimals, you could literally just type in two exclamation point. Okay? Now by the definition of a factorial, two factorial is just going to be two times one. So that's just equal to two. And so you see that decimals tells us that. All right. So again, you just by typing in, doing shift, and then the number one, you get the exclamation point. It knows that you're trying to do a factorial symbol. Okay. Now, on still on decimals, if you go down to functions, click where you see stats, and you see the at the bottom of that menu, right in the middle there, you see the n factorial. So you can put that in there and then type in type in two that way. Okay, so two different ways to get to the same thing. On the graphing calculator. Um, for the graphing calculator, if you type in the number two first, hit math, and then you want to go to where it says probability. For probability, and you see the fourth option down is the exclamation point, and it gives you the answer that way. So again, that was math scroll over to PR, PROB for probability, and the fourth option down is the exclamation point. Okay? Um, and so now that you know where that is, I'm not gonna keep going, uh, switching screens back and forth. I wanna try to uh, keep that as little as possible. But uh, what I would recommend is, you know, for 16 factorial, we're I'm gonna go do that right now, but I would just double check that you you get the same answer as I do. Just make sure you have the steps down, okay? 
So looking at, I guess I'm kind of going out of order, looking at 16 factorial, type that into your calculator. And again, just double check that you're getting the same thing that I do. Okay, I get 2922789888000. Okay, so a really big number. Because again, 16 factorial is 16 times 15 times 14 times 13, etc., all the way down to 1. Okay, double check 5 factorial. Should get 120. Now, for 6 factorial divided by 3 factorial, when you're on your calculator, uh, whether it's decimals or the graphing calculator, I would recommend to put the 6 factorial and the 3 factorial in its own set of parentheses like that. Sometimes your calculator can just misunderstand and misinterpret what you're trying to write in there. Okay? Another idea I want to go over here is that 6 factorial is 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Okay? And it should be a... Let's add the random plus sign in there. Okay? Now, 3 factorial on the bottom is 3 times 2 times 1. Okay. Notice right here, on top and bottom, we have the same thing, so that can cross out. And I just show you that because then really all we're doing here is 6 times 4, or 6 times 5, which is 30, times 4. And so even by just typing in your calculator, you should get 120 there. Okay. Now, so that's the idea on, on factorial. So how are we going to use that in counting methods? You are going to use factorials, and again, this is good for your the table that you're going to be using. When you're choosing all of the items, there are no repeats, you are going to use n factorial. Okay? So what does choosing all the items mean? Well, let's look at the first example. It says, how many ways can you arrange five pictures on the wall? So, in other words, you have five pictures, and once you hang one picture up, you can't hang it up again. So there's, you're not repeating, and implied in the question is that you're hanging all of the pictures. So you're not just hanging two of them or three of them or four of them, you're hanging all five. Okay. Now, again, we earlier in the first video, we talked about drawing a picture, and I'm going to ask you to do that here. So if I'm trying to arrange five pictures, let's put a blank for representing each picture. Okay. So this picture kind of represents each spot that a picture could go on the wall. And in the first spot, on the far left, you haven't hung a picture yet, so you still have five to choose from. Okay, well, let's say you, you hang a picture there. Going over to the next spot, you only have four pictures left to choose from. And then you hang a picture there. So then you only have three, then two, then only one picture that can go in the last spot. And so it becomes this five factorial, so 120. Okay. But again, I think drawing a picture would help you kind of understand that. All right. Part B, how many numbers can be made from the digits 2, 5, 1, and 7? Okay. Um, now, one thing, it, this should be a little bit more specific and say that you are not going to repeat the digits. So in other words, in part B, you can't have the number uh, 2,222. Okay. Um, but what we do look at is uh, that you're, you are choosing all of that. So you're going to make a four-digit number. And again, you're not going to repeat that four-digit number. And so because you have four numbers to choose from, two, five, one, and seven, again, if we want to draw a picture, before you pick the first number, you have four left to choose from, two, five, one, and seven. So you have four options. Okay. Now, let's say that in the first blank, you chose the number two. Well, then going to the second slot, you only have three left. And then let's say you chose the number five. And then going to the third slot, you only have two left. You chose the number one to go there. And so in that last slot, there's only one possibility left. Okay. Again, the idea was that I chose all the numbers. I didn't repeat any, any of the numbers. And so one shortcut I've could have, I could have done instead of drawing the picture is saying that there's four numbers to choose from. I'm choosing them all without repeating. And so it would just be four factorial or 24.
different ways to arrange those numbers. Okay. Now, this is actually going to be a little bit of a review from our last video. Part C, how many numbers can be made if you can repeat? So looking at your table and maybe thinking back to our last set of homework problems in, in the last video, one method we learned I just call the exponent method. And one idea with the exponent method is that you can repeat. So in other words, using this problem, we could have the number 2,222. Well, because you can repeat, again, this is why a picture is helpful, because it can be kind of confusing on, well, when am I supposed to use exponents? When am I supposed to use factorials? Well, a picture kind of clar clarifies that for you. If I can repeat, then I will always have four options of numbers. For each digit, I will have two, five, one, and seven. Okay, it doesn't matter what number goes in each slot because it's saying that I can repeat. And so again, just reviewing what you have in the table and what we did in the last video. Because you're selecting all of the items and you can repeat those items, the number of ways would be represented by four to the fourth power, which would be 256. So 256 ways if you could repeat the digits. Okay. So again, to re recap the factorial symbol, you're going to use the factorial when you're choosing all items and you cannot repeat. And again, drawing these kind of lines as a picture will be helpful for you. So now let's look at a difference when we're choosing some items and we can't repeat. Okay, so it says there are 40 applicants for four jobs, a computer programmer, a software tester, a manager, and a systems engineer. Now, think about when you look at that, if there are four different jobs defined, the order that you, that they select somebody for these jobs does matter, okay? Now, they're all coming from the same pool. So let's just hypothetically say that they're gonna pick the computer programmer first, okay? Well, there's 40 applicable, app, applicants excuse me, for the computer programming job. So because they haven't selected any applicant yet, there's 40 possibilities. Okay. Then the second job they're going to select is for the software tester. Well, they already selected and hired somebody for the computer programmer job. So now for the software tester, there's 39 left because okay? the same person isn't going to do two jobs. Now for the manager, again, same idea here. They've now filled two positions, which means that there's only 38 left. And then for the systems engineer, they've filled three positions. There's 30 applicants left there. Okay, so to figure out how many different possibilities there are, we are going to do 40 times 39 times 38 times 37. And you should get, uh, it's like 2,193,360 different ways that those jobs could be filled in. Okay. Now, a couple things to talk about here. Again, there was 40 applicants, but we're only worried about four. So that's what it means when it says you're choosing some of the items. And it also says that we are not repeating. Okay. So again, the idea would be that if you were hired for the computer programmer job, you're not also going to be the manager and vice versa. Okay. And the order does matter here. Start planting that seed now before we get on to the next, the next page, just to ex explain what order matters versus order not mattering. Order does matter here because if you are hired to be a computer programmer, your job is going to be pretty different than somebody who's a software tester. Okay, and so the order in which you're hired would matter because all the jobs are so different. And so the method that we use when order matters is called a permutation. Okay, um, now this formula is how you compute a permutation where it says n is the number of things you choose from. So on that last example, n equals 40 and r is the number that you're actually choosing. So again, in that last example, 
r equals 40, or excuse me, 4. Okay? Now, there is a much simpler way to do this, and again, it goes back to using your calculator. Um, I'm going to start on decimals. So if you, I'm going to clear out what I had there, but if you look back at the functions menu, go to stats, down by the exclamation point, you will see NCR and NPR. P standing for permutations, C standing for combinations. So you can use this calculator to help you figure out a permutation or a combination. Okay, now I'm going to do that, go back to that uh, computer programming example. So I'm going to hit the NPR button because I decided it was a permutation since the ordered mattered. And there was 40 applicants to choose from, and I was trying to figure out four jobs. So 40 applicants to choose from, four to select from, and you see that 2,193,360 number. So with decimals, you have to type in, you have to choose the function first, NPR or NCR, and then you type in the numbers. It always goes with the biggest number, comma, and the smallest number. On a graphing calculator, that looks a little bit different. Okay? So on my graphing calculator, if I'm at the if I'm at the home screen, go back to math, go back to probability, and here's where you see the NPR and the NCR. Now, for those of you on your graphing calculator, you actually need to type in in this case 40 you need to type that in first then go to math then go again you have to pick which one we're talking about a permutation so go down to the second option and then type in four and you see the two million one hundred ninety three thousand three hundred sixty number again okay and so again there is no need to know this formula but what you will need to know is how to use the NPR function on your calculator. If you're using decimals, that's fine. Again, you'll have access to decimals while you're taking the test. If you have a graphing calculator, that obviously works as well. Okay. Again, as, I, as you're filling out that table, the idea here is that you're choosing some items. So 40 applicants, but we're only choosing four of them. You can't repeat. And order matters. Okay. And as you saw in the last example, the last example was actually a permutation example, and you can draw a picture to help you with that. Let's go over a couple more examples. It says, how many ways can first, second, and third place be earned when 15 people compete? So here's where I'm not going to go back and forth over and over again. Um, but how many ways can first, second, and third be earned when 15 people compete? So again, if you're choosing some. We have a total of 15 people, but we're only choosing the top three. And in this case, the order matters. Okay? Order matters because we're delineating between first, second, and third. Meaning that first place is different than second place is different than third place. Okay? So because the order does matter, it's going to be a permutation. Now again, make sure you're practicing this and not just copying down what I have. Um, so on your calculator, you should do 15 PR or on decimals, it would be, um, you would hit the NPR button first and do uh, 15 comma three. Either way, no matter how you do it, um, let's see what we get. 15, permutation three, you should get 2,730 different ways to, for 15 people to finish that race. Okay. And so, again, order matters in this case, which is why it was a permutation. Um, and actually, I am going to skip B, you can cross that one out. That one is not a permutation, that's a combination. We haven't gotten over that yet. We will do that in the next video. Okay, um, and let's go over a couple examples, just going over a review of stuff that we did in this video and the last one. Okay, so 
says, sorry, it's a little blurry. But it says the chess club must decide when where to meet for practice. The possible days are Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Possible times are three, four, five, and there are eight classrooms available. Okay. Now, when you read this, start thinking about what we've talked about so far in terms of does order matter? Um, are my choosing some or all? Uh, going back to the last video, am I choosing one from each category? Can I repeat, etc. Okay. Well, you're not going to repeat, meaning that you're not going to choose uh, more than, you know, you're going to choose just Tuesday, just Wednesday, or just Thursday. Um, the order does matter, just in the sense of you have to figure out where exactly where and when you're going. Uh, but really what you're doing here is you're picking one from each category. Okay, so you're picking one day out of three available. And then you're picking one time out of three available. And then you're just picking one classroom out of eight available. Okay, and so this is a fundamental counting principle problem where you're picking one item from each category. And so it just becomes three times three times eight. And so there would be 72 different ways that you could arrange this meeting. Okay. Remember when we read, especially the, there are eight classroom parts, you're only going to choose one of those classrooms. And so I know earlier we did a problem about like pizza toppings and we drew a line for each topping and said, yes, no, yes, no. But in this case, in that case, we were we could select all of the pizza toppings or none of them. In this case, we can we can only select one classroom. Okay, and so that was the idea behind the fundamental counting principle: select one from an entire group. A math quiz has ten true or false questions. Okay, now when you when we see this problem, um, you you're not picking one from a group or from different categories, uh, the order doesn't necessarily matter and you're picking all of them. And for each, for each question, you have two options, true or false. And so this is an exponent problem. You're choosing them all. You could repeat. Well, true all the way down would be a possible answer. And so 2 to the 10th power or 1,024 different ways to answer the questions on that test. Sandwich shop has three types of sandwiches, ham, turkey, and chicken. Each sandwich can be ordered with white, or white bread or multigrain bread. Customers can add any combination of seven available toppings. Okay, so here's a little bit of a mixture problem because you're only gonna choose, uh, I know when you go to Subway, let's say you could have more than one type of deli meat. For this purpose, we're just going to say that you can only choose one. So from the deli meat category, you're only choosing one, which there's three options. And then you're choosing two different types of bread. And now again, we have to be careful with the wording of this question. It says customers can add any combination of the seven available toppings. So here's the difference between this sentence and the first one where I said you can only choose one type of meat. If they would have said you can use any uh, any type of meat for your, or any combination of meat for your sandwich, then that would be slightly different. Down here it says add any combination. So again, the idea would be that you have, for seven different toppings, you have two options. Yes or no. And so that's a, that part of it becomes an expo exponent part, two to the seventh power. All right. So again, as you're going through that, let's see, three times two to the eighth power is 768 different ways to order a sandwich. Um, but again, I, it's really important to, to note here that the way that you read these and the wording is gonna mean all the difference. And so in this case, in that last sentence, the fact that it said any combination tells you that you could have all of the toppings or none of the toppings or anything in between. There are 100 politicians at a meeting. They each give a Valentine's Day card to everyone else. How many cards were given? Okay. Well, if everybody's going to give a 
a Valentine's Day card to everyone else. Um, again, think of think of if you were in this in this situation. Okay, you would have ninety nine Valentine's Day cards that you're handing out. Okay, and if everybody has ninety nine. Uh, excuse me, 99 cards that they're going to give out, then it would be 99 times 99. Okay. Oh, excuse me, 100 times 99, because there's 100 politicians, and they're each going to hand out 99 different Valentine's Day cards. Okay, and so that would be 9,900. The same politicians ran away, so then how many different ways could they finish? So in this case, we are choosing all of them because it says how many different ways could they finish. Um, and so if we're choosing all of them, I'm not even going to type this into the calculator. It's going to be a really big number, but you would just do 100 factorial. It's not worried about top three or anything like that. It's saying if all of them ran the same race, how can they finish? All right. Uh, so your homework that aligns with this would be uh, learning target 2.2. That'll mainly just be factorials and permutations. Um, it won't be as much of a review as we did on the notes here. Your next video, we'll talk about combinations, and then uh, there actually will be one additional video that goes over some review questions just, just to kind of get the ideas down on how we identify what type of question it is.